Our scripture reading this morning is from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and this is from the, uh, the Living Bible. It says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Good to see you this morning. Glad you could be with us. Um, We've got a new year, and we're talking about the kinds of things that people generally set uh, New Year's resolutions about. Uh, it's, it always has interested me that the, the things that are the most important to humans, the Bible always has a lot to say about it. And uh, the things that are most important to people in New Year's with a New Year's resolution, they look at their lives, they see things they want to change, and uh, the Bible says things about those things. And so um, this morning we're going to talk about, about fitness. And uh, not just physical fitness, but fitness. You know, words have meanings, right? Uh, it's not... Uh, uh, did he, did he, did he besides me see the news where the, uh, the, uh, the chaplain at the Capitol ended a, a prayer to Brahma and to God or gods and, and ended it with amen and a women? Yeah. Did you guys see that? Um, listen, words have meanings. And the word amen has nothing to do with gender. The word amen is an ancient, ancient word that goes across multiple languages with the same spelling and the same sounds. And what it means is, so be it. That's what it means in Hebrew. That's what it means in Greek. That's what it means in English. Um, somebody jokingly said, well, if, uh, if, uh, if amen means uh, uh, let it be said, then a women means a woman said it. No, see, words have meanings. And uh, this was driven home to me as I, uh, when I was in Hebrew class because there are words in other languages that if you take the sounds of those words, sometimes in our, word, in our language, they're curse words. And if you're, if you're struggling with studying languages, a good language teacher will tell you those things so you can get those hooks in your head. And so uh, one day we were studying vocabulary and the Hebrew word for tent is ohel. And so the Hebrew teacher said, if you're having trouble, remember that, remember this. You get angry and you say, oh, hell, I went to my tent. But remember, he said, that that's not what that word means in that language. There's other words in that language for what we use oh, hell for. The word fitness is kind of like that. There's more to fitness than just physical fitness. There's more to fitness than just being able to go to the gym and, uh, and outlift Lee, which good luck with that. You know, he, he, uh, he has a bad back these, year, these days, but he can still outlift me and uh, probably you as well. He may wish he had when he goes back home and has to take some aspirin or ibuprofen or whatever. But uh, uh, fitness is more than that. There's more to fitness than life. The word fitness doesn't mean fitness necessarily physically fit. It just means um, it, it means that it's apt or well designed for something. Um, there are certain vehicles that are fit for the water and other vehicles that are fit for the road. And if you take a road vehicle into the surf and out into the ocean, it's unfit for that usage, right? Uh, there's certain clothing that's fit for the warmth of summer and there's certain clothing that's fit for a driving blizzard. And if you put on a, 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 a bathing suit and, and, and flippers and you go out in a driving snowstorm, you're unfit. You're unfitly prepared for that storm. And that's kind of the way the word fitness is. Um, uh, let, let's think about this. See, that text is pretty small, isn't it? No, maybe you can read that. That's good. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside, and he is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. The purpose of becoming a Christian is to make you fit, not just for this world, but for this world. Why? Because God made this world. And, it's, and, and the purpose of being a godly person is so that you're fit for human society. Why? Because God created humans and God created human society. Um, Becoming a Christian isn't just making yourself fit for the world to come. It makes you fit for this world. I'm convinced 
if you could tell me, if you could prove to me there was no God, I'd still want to live as a Christian. You know why? Because it's the best way to live. It's the best way for a society to function. It's the best way for a family to function. And so even if you could prove to me there was no God, and you can't, because I can't prove to you there is one. God is a matter of belief. We walk by faith and not by sight. But there's a fitness that comes with being a follower of God. Being an active believer, being a growing Christian makes you a better father, makes you a better mother, makes you a better mate, makes you a better employee, makes you a better citizen, uh, makes you more fit, more apt for the world we live in in this world. Now, it should also make you more fit for the next world as well. But the first tests are here. The first tests for fitness are here. And so I know people sometimes that they have this, they have a skewed vision of heaven. And they'll say, well, you know, I, I view heaven as everybody floating around in a crowd playing a harp. And, and the Bible nowhere says that humans become angels. And the Bible nowhere says angels float on clouds and play harps. But people have this vision in their head and they say, you know, if, 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 if heaven lasts an eternity, I think I'd get bored pretty quick. Um, there was a Billy Joel song back in the 70s that says something about uh uh, sinners are a lot more fun. I'm talking about, I think it's the whole song. The song was talking about Catholic girls being raised uh, to not, to not be. You know. Anyway, the point is, some people have that idea, right? They have that idea that 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 uh, you know, heaven is that way, and so I'm not sure I want to be. Listen, that's what this world is for. That's what this world is for. See, if you go to heaven, you're going to be there with God's people. Wouldn't you want to check that out here? before you get locked in for eternity? If you really believe that, if you really believe that eternity might get boring or that you might get to be too much or you might get... Why wouldn't you want to go to church and get to know God's people? If you're going to be stuck with them, quote, in heaven for eternity, shouldn't you learn to get along with them here? Yeah, see, that's what, that's what, that's what fitness does for you. Fitness means apt to function well, apt to get along, apt to get along. Why? Why in our culture do people date before they get married instead of parents just deciding the, ma the, the, the wedding for them? Because in our culture, we've decided that young people ought to have a chance to get to know each other and find out if they can stand each other or not. Other societies have looked at it differently. They say, well, young people aren't wise enough to make those serious decisions. So it's our job to pick out the best mate for them. And there's pluses and minuses both ways. And people function both ways all through history. But I kind of like our way, you know. I enjoyed dating Tammy before I married her. And it's kind of nice that she had the chance to back out before she said, I do. Because now I can say, well, she chose, right? It's her pick. And that's the beautiful thing about the fitness of being a Christian is, as you're a Christian, you become a new person. And every day that we wake up, whether she wants to or not, she is picking to be with me. Boy, that's cool. To have one person on the face of this planet. See what I mean about being fit, being apt? And what allows her to do that is she's a Christian. And she understands my weaknesses. And she understands my failures. And she understands that there is a God in heaven. And she understands that my success and failure is not just on her shoulders because there is a God in heaven. Right? Fitness. Um, so when you become a Christian... A new life has begun for you. And if that's not true for you, then I don't know what you signed up for, but you didn't sign up for New Testament Christianity. You are supposed to be a different person than you used to be. You are supposed to be different from people who don't claim to be Christians. You're supposed to be different. There's supposed to be something strange and weird about you. So somebody says, preacher, you're just weird. Thank you. Number one, I want to be different from the world. Number two, can I say this? I've not met a whole lot of preachers that I wanted to be like. I've met a lot of plumbers that I wanted to be like. I've met carpenters I wanted to be like. I've met truck drivers that I wanted to be like. I've met teachers that I wanted to be like. But I've met too many preachers that I want to be about. Like. Somebody says, man, you're a strange preacher. Thank you. Thank you. That means I'm more apt. I'm more fit for what I'm hoping to do for you. And that is I hope to be your friend. And I hope to influence you to live a different life so that we can be together forever. That's my goal. Somebody says, well, that's just kind of strange. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody says, well, why would you keep forgiving that wife or that husband? You know, you, you, you could be so much better off if you just dump them and get somebody else. Number one, that's not true. You say, well, preacher, what do you mean? Well, I have a friend that's a psychologist that, uh, that, that helps 
marriages that are in trouble. And one of the things he, uh, he said made a lot of sense to me one time. He said, you know, he said, every marriage, he said, research shows that every marriage has a bis- basket of seven to ten irreconcilable differences. And so if you're going to get divorced because of irreconcilable differences, the Bible says there are reasons to get divorced. And you can't be abandoned by a mate. And you can't go on and live <laughs> and function and be fit for society. But if your idea is, well, you know, if we, if, if we just can't get along, if something just little, if, if, if there's any little thing, every family, every marriage has between seven and ten irreconcilable differences. And if you decide to divide, there's two things that happen. Number one, you take your basket with you and your basket has part of those problems with it because you are the cause of some of those problems. Can we be honest about that? And the second thing is, if you decide somebody else, you're going to find somebody else to spend your life with, and you decide to become a second marriage or a second family, guess what they bring with them? (laughs) Hello. They bring their basket with them. And so the two of you get back together and guess down what you've got. A basket of seven to ten irreconcilable differences. And so there are people that live their entire life because they don't understand Scripture. They don't understand aptness or fitness for this part of society. They spend their entire lives looking for the perfect person, never stopping to think that if you find the perfect person, you won't be qualified to spend life with them. Because you're not perfect. See, that's what fitness and aptness will teach you. Becoming a new person helps you with these things. And so we find, uh, for example, in, uh, in Romans chapter 7, Paul says this, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it wrong because it's sin that's living in me that does it. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And you know the answer to that question. Who frees you from that kind of a life? Who frees you from that kind of a problem? Who makes you fit and and apt to live in a world where what you want and who you are and how you live and what you want to live are are not different. How do you navigate that? And the answer is you do that through Christ Jesus. It's Christ that forgives you. It's Christ that enables other people to forgive you. And so there's a fitness that comes with following Jesus with these things. Uh, Let's let's look back at the the reading from this morning. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Paul says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Why should a Christian care about physical health and physical fitness and physical aptness in this world? I mean, if you're a Christian, the goal really is to successfully live through this life and move on to the next one. So why should we care about fitness? Why don't we just uh, go out in a blaze of glory and, and commit suicide so we can get to heaven quicker? People say, Rick, you're strange. Why do you ask, even ask those kind of questions? Thank you. I ask those kind of questions because they're important to people. They're important to people. Why should you care about your physical health if, if God has forgiven you and you're a spirit being and so you're going to go on and live in heaven anyway? Why should you go to the doctor? Why should you lose weight? Would you believe I've lost about 25 pounds since COVID started? I'm pretty proud of that. A lot of people I know gained weight through the through the, uh, the, uh, the 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 pandemic. Why should that even matter? I mean, we're spirit beings. We're Christians. We belong to a a a a, a, a spiritual religion. Why should we care about this body? Paul gives us that answer. He says, because there's a peace of God living in you. Not only were you made by the image of God. Not only are you connected to God because of creation. Not just because of your legacy as a human. But as a Christian, God has put a piece of himself in you. There's, there's, there, the, the Holy Spirit is in you. And so for Christians, the temple is not a building. The temple is you. I have to be honest with you. The first time I visited this church, uh, we drove up into the parking lot and I said, wow, that building's not much to look at, is it? <laughs> Some of you are laughing. 
Some of you are looking at me like, how can you stand to say that? My grandparents lived. I understand. I'm just telling you, that was my first impression was, you know, that, 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 that building's not much to look at. But we found the people that meet here to be much different than the way the building looks from the street. See, that's the way it should be with you. And yet, why do we shovel the snow? Why do we have somebody clean the building? Why do we have uh, the glass doors with the little fingerprints and nose prints taken off of it? Because this building represents us to this community. Why do we have a nice sign out front that uses colors and flashing things? Because we're part of this part of town. We're, we're, we're part of Old Town uh, Bellevue. And, and we, we want, with our less than stellar building, to put on the best clothes that we can. We keep it painted. We keep the grass mowed. You know? Uh, we, we fix potholes in the parking lot. Where does it say in the Bible you can use church money for potholes? Well... It's part of the, the way we present. Where, where does the Bible say that Christians ought to care about the way they look and how they dress? And Well, because it, the same kind of idea, right? This, this, this building, this property represents us to the community. And you, because the Holy Spirit is in you and me, we represent God. So are we going to be the most beautiful? Probably not. You know, let's just face it. Most of us aren't going to be on the on the cover of Men's Health or Vogue magazine or, uh, you know, most of our houses are not going to be an architectural digest. And yet, we bathe, right? We go to the doctor. We take vitamins if we need them. We take medicines if we need them. We wear masks if we need to. Why do we do that? Because we want to be apt. We want to be fit for society. And why is that important? Because we, we represent God. We carry a piece of God with us everywhere we go. You don't belong to yourself, the passage says. For God bought you with a high price. He didn't wait till you were on sale and brought you at a discount. He bought you with a high price. Um, there are stories told ever so often about some societies where, uh, where people have bride prices where they um, they pay a bride price for a new bride. And, and uh, in these cultures, the father wants the most for his daughter he can get because she's going to join another family and be an ad addition to them. And many times men want to buy their price, want to pay as little as they can for their wives. And there's so often you'll hear a story from these cultures about a guy who willingly chose to pay a high price for his wife. The Bible tells us one of those stories, from the story of, uh, of Jacob, where there were two daughters, there were two girls, and he was interested in one. And the father cheated him, and he wound up getting married to the sister who was covered by the veil, and he, couldn't, he didn't know which sister he was getting. And so he worked a bunch of years for one, and he had to work a bunch of years a second time for the second wife. Why? Because she was worth that to him. See, when God bought you, he bought you with a price. He's invested a lot in you from the day you become a Christian. You say, well, my life is still a mess. He, bought, he paid a lot for you. He paid a lot for you. One of the things that I, I like to do is I, I, uh, I like to look at old cars and old pickups. And I'm hoping that one of these days I can find me an old pickup that's, uh, that's still, you know, mechanically sound, but uh, I don't want to pay a lot of money for it. And, and so I look online and I look at prices and I look at conditions. And I look... When God bought me, he, he, he bought the equivalent of a wreck on blocks. I, watched, I, I bought, a, uh, I bought a, a, a Triumph Spitfire one time and I had to replace, replace every piece of rubber in that car. You think about that for just a minute. You think about your vehicle and think about making it roadworthy by changing every piece of rubber. I'm not just talking about the tires and the hoses, although I had to place those too. I'm talking about every grommet. I'm talking about the, uh, the engine mounts. I'm talking about uh, any place that wires were covered or went through a rubber grommet of any kind, uh, seals on the body, uh, anything that had rubber, I had to replace. Now, I thought I got a good deal in that car. I paid maybe $800 for it. But by the time I'm changing out all these pieces of rubber, I'm thinking I may have paid too much for this car. 
And then when I got it fixed where it would work, I had to carry a truck. If you've ever had a little British sports car, know anybody that has, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I had to keep a set of tools and parts in the trunk, including bailing wire, uh, duct tape, and uh, super glue. And a friend of mine had a car just like mine, and the bumper sticker on his car said, the parts falling off of this car are the finest British manufacturing available. <laughs> well, see, in the world we live in, that's you and me. We're the little British sports car with the parts falling off of it, with the, the, the driver needing a trunk full of parts and tools to get to the store and back. And if you're smart, you need to go with other people who are driving the same kind of cars so that all of you can get back home together. That's why you see these kind of cars on, on, on road days. They all go together because somebody's going to break down and somebody's bound to have the tool or the parts you need. And so you just get, you travel along with your buddies and you make a day out of it. And you go get some ice cream and you come back home. See, that, that's what Christianity is supposed to be for us. You and I are those cars. And it's God that has bought us. We don't belong to ourselves. And he's put his spirit in us. And he keeps repairing us, and he keeps fixing us as we fall apart. And as the parts fall off of us, he picks them up and he puts them back on us. And there's none of us that can brag and say, well, look how great I am. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Another way of looking at this is talked about in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul here is talking about using the example of a, of a home or a house. And he says, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. Now, you think about that just for a minute. In my house, we've got a cabinet by the front door that's covered by glass doors. And inside that cabinet is china that was hand-painted and hand-fired by Tammy's grandmother. You think I've ever had a meal off any of those plates? Why? Because they are, her grandmother has passed now, and they were given to her as a special gift. And so those plates are not to eat on. Those plates are to treasure. But when we moved in this house, there were a couple plates left on the top shelf in one of the cabinets that they missed. <laughs> they don't match any of the rest of her plates. There's just two of them. Uh, we've seen some kind of like them at a shelf on Walmart, at Walmart or Target one time. Have, have I eaten off of those? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got Granny's China. You've got the left behind plates. And you go out to the garage and you've got a Menards bucket, plastic bucket that I use to gather up trash in my garage. You see the different kind of vessels? Different kind of vessels have a different kind of use, right? And so Paul uses the example here. He says, in, 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 a, in a household, there's different levels of uses. There are different levels of vessels. All of them are vessels. All of them hold things. The, 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 and so he says, if a man or a, a person therefore purge themselves from these, he will be a vessel to honor, sanctified, and fit for the master's use, prepared to every good work. See, as a Christian, you have God's Spirit in you, so, so you are a vessel. Now, here's the question. What kind of vessel are you and what are you worth? What function do you play in that household? Are you the Menards bucket that sits in the garage to collect garbage? Is that all you're good for? Well, that's, it's a need. It's a good thing. You know, you, got, you need to be able to sweep your shop every so often and have some place to collect it. So it's worthwhile. It's worth having. The problem is many people think they are Granny's China. <laughs> when they're a Menard bucket. And regardless of which you are, it's because of the fitness that you have for those circumstances. A Menard's bucket is not fit for her china cabinet. It wouldn't even fit. The glass door wouldn't close. So you can't take a Menard's bucket and stick it in the china. It just won't, it just won't work. I guess you could build its own cabinet and put your own glass. But why would you want to? It's just... It's just for collecting dust. It's just for collecting stuff that breaks. <laughs> and it goes, carries stuff to the garbage. And is that useful? Yeah, it's useful. But wouldn't you want to be fit for more than that? Don't, don't, you, don't you want to be more than that? Don't you want to be somebody? Don't you want to make a difference in the world? Don't you want folks to miss you if you're gone or if you die? 
when you're laid in the ground, don't you want somebody to visit your grave? Don't you want them to, to wish they had known you and to tell stories about you? I, say, I don't care about that preacher. Okay, that's just the way we're different. I want to be somebody. I want to make a difference. And I'm looking for other people that want to make a difference. And yeah, if, 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 if what the kingdom of God needs is a Menards bucket to carry garbage, I'm willing to carry garbage. But I went to school so I could do more than carry garbage because I wanted to be more value to the church. That's why I've got four degrees in Bible and and, and ministry kind of subjects. Somebody said, well, well, are you bragging? No, I'm not bragging. I'm not any more valuable than the Menard Bucket. But I'd like to be something besides a Menard Bucket. Does that make any sense? Maybe another better example would be the difference between a a fine bone china cup and and a clay mug that you throw on the desk of your car or that you throw in the microwave, but you don't take the fine china and throw it around. No, 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 no. In fact, some people don't even put their china in the dishwasher because it might chink, chink, chink too much. Right? Here's another place that Paul talks about this idea of fitness. In this case, he's comparing fitness for all of life with the fitness of the body. He says, uh, 1 Timothy 4, 8, he says, exercise daily in God. There are people that go to the gym every day. I used to go to the gym every day. You can't tell by looking at me now. Uh, my knees won't hold up to that level of exercise anymore, but that's I used to. I used to, I used to do that kind of stuff. Uh, but he says, exercise daily in God. Um, no spiritual flabbiness, please. Are, are you flabby spiritually? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe you're flabby enough that other people can recognize it and say, boy, you're really letting yourself go, buddy. Workouts in the gymnasium are useful, but a disciplined life in God is far more so, making you fit both today and forever. So what Paul's saying is this. Yeah, it's good to be physically fit, and you should, you should take care of your body because you are part of God. You have God, you have the, the Holy Spirit, a piece of God in you. But there's more to you than what you can see in the mirror. There's more to you than what is underneath your clothes. There's the physical you, and the physical you is very important because God put his spirit in you. But there's something even more important than the physical you, and that is the mental and spiritual you. And so Paul's point here is you ought to be physically fit, but if you're only going to be fit in one way or the other, if you've only got a limited amount of time, Maybe you should spend it in God's Word rather than lifting weights in the gym. Well, preacher, I think I can do both. Great. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Physical exercise does some good. And there's that connection between the body and the mind. There's times that just getting up and taking a walk, getting some fresh air will clear your mind and let you do what you're, 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 you're otherwise do it, trying to do. Um, I don't do that enough. I'll sometimes be sitting at my desk working on something. The next thing I know, three hours have gone by and I haven't got up and walked around any. And people say, I can tell. Look at you. Right? I can tell. Look at you. How about this verse from Proverbs? Proverbs 18, verse 14. The wise man Solomon says, A healthy spirit conquers adversity, but what can you do when the spirit is crushed? You take two people and the exact same thing happens to them. One of them keeps right on going and the other one gives up and just quits. What's the difference? What's the difference? You take two people and they're raised by by poor family, poor family environments. And they're they're and they and they have uh, have bad parents that treated them badly. One of them goes on to become successful and one of them goes on to become a criminal. And the criminal says, it's not my fault. Mama didn't love me as much as she loved my sister. And the one who went on and becomes successful says, it doesn't matter how she loved me or my sister. It's up to me now. I'm the one at bat. For every person that's had a poor past that went on to have a poor life, you can look at at least as many people who had a poor life, a poor past, and went on and had a great life. What's the difference? Well, the wise man Solomon says it's, it's, it's the spirit it's the person that's inside of you that makes the difference. So there's not just a physical fitness, but there's a spiritual fitness. There's a spiritual fitness. Why is it there are some people like Job who says, 
I lost my family. I lost my, 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 all my wealth. I lost all my crops. I lost everything. Naked, I came into the world. Naked, I'm going to go back. Regardless, praise be the name of the Lord. And his wife, who went through exactly the same things he did, and her words were, I can't stand to see you hurt this bad, Job. Just curse God so you can die and get it over with. I don't think she was an evil person trying to get him to do evil things. I think she was looking at him the way we look at a cat that's been run over by a car. There's times to just put the cat out of its misery or the dog or the bird or whatever it is. And I think that's what was going on with Job's wife. I think she saw him suffer so much. I don't think she was an evil person. I think she was just saying, look, let it go, man. And Job says, no, I'm not going to let it go. What's the difference? They both suffered through the same thing. It was, they, 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 the children that died were both of their children. And you see that today too, right? You'll see people in churches or in communities. And they both have the exact same thing happen to them. And one of them just becomes a hermit. And one goes on to do something else. That's the, uh, by the way, that's the history behind this organization called MAD. Do you know what the word MAD stands for? M-A-D-D? You ever seen it? Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. How many mothers have lost children to you that are children driving poorly or someone else driving poorly and, and, they, and they die in a car accident? Lots of them. So how come some of them sat at home and cried and somebody else says, I'm going to form an organization and make this a, make this a, 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 a thing for society to talk about and work on? What makes a difference? In both cases, children died. In both cases, you were suffering. In both cases, horrible things happened. It's the spirit inside that makes a difference. And listen, the people that started Mothers Against Drug Drivers, they're not any, under any illusions. They're not crazy. They don't think, if I can just get enough people on board, my children will come back to life. No, that's not what they're thinking. That's not what they're thinking. So what are some principles that will help you be, uh, be, be physically fit? Uh, here's, th here's three of them. We're going to look at these very briefly, and then the lesson will be yours. Uh, the first one is we've got to trust God. The second one is we've got to get enough rest. And the third one is we've got to pursue physical health. And I said, well, that's pretty simple. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's simple. It's simple. Uh, let's look at a couple of passages that are talking about this. Um, Psalm 30, verse 2 says, Oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. Um, I wish I'd looked this up. There's a passage in the Old Testament where there was a king uh, who wasn't healed, and the Bible says he wasn't healed because he didn't ask God to heal him. <laughs> if you struggle with physical things, you should pray to God about that. You should ask him to heal you. You should ask him to make your life better. Now, what if he doesn't heal you? Somebody said, well, I asked God to heal me of something, but I'm still struggling with it. Or I had, a, had an uncle that had cancer, and we asked God to heal him, and, and he still died. So why did God let him die? I don't know. you got to remember that God is sovereign. God is king. You're not. God's in control. You're not. But listen, there are times that God doesn't act because his people don't ask him to. You say, well, I thought God was God. He could do anything. He can. And as God, he has chosen to work in community with humans and spirits, other spirit beings. We've been studying about angels on Wednesday night. And he has chosen to work in concert with humans. And there are stories all through the Bible where humans ask God and God changed his mind. One of the most telling is when the, uh, the, uh, the angels came to visit Abraham. And they're on the way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham stops and says, well, would you save the city for 50 people? Yeah, I'll save it for 50. How about 40? Yeah. How about 30? How about 20? How about 10? It's, 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 the, it's the biblical story that brings the, the uh, socially unacceptable phrase, they Jewed them down. If you're in a Jewish community where there are Jewish people, they don't like you saying that because it's, 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 a, it, it's insulting to them. But that's what, exactly what Abraham did. 
He bargained with God for less and for less and for less. Why? And why did God say, okay, I'll do that. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, I'll do that. Why? Because Abraham asked. Jesus says, or I guess it was uh, James says, you have not because you ask not. Are there things you would do for your children if they asked, but you probably wouldn't bother if they didn't? How about your grandkids? Are there things that if your grandkids looked at you and said, Papa, we found out that our younger daughter is going to have a, uh, have a baby girl, God willing, in, uh, in May. This will be her first. And she'll be, the, the baby will be our second granddaughter. We've got mostly grandsons. And one of the comments that came up on this, the text was uh, from, uh, <laughs> from my son who said, Well, Uncle Brian better get his wallet warmed up if this one's as good at getting money out of him as his other, other niece is. <laughs> Why is this niece good at getting money out of Uncle Brian? Because she bats her eyes and she says, Uncle Brian, I love you. Would you get this for me? And he's got a son that he won't give the son money to when he gives the, the, the niece money to. Why? Because she asks. See, humans are made in the image of God. That's one of the ways we're God-like. We respond to things kind of the way God does. Right? We instinctually... If, 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 if a little boy comes up to you and pleadingly says, please go catch the ball with me, Papa. I need to practice for the game next week. If you can at all, and if you got any kind of manhood about you, what are you going to do? Come on, boy, let's go. Let's go. Papa, I need a little money to go shopping with Nana. I don't have to ask Nana for money. I want my own money. What are you going to do? C -c Come here. How, just how much do you think you need? If they're a little older, you might even just give them your credit card. They'll say, Shh, don't tell Nana. See, I cried to God and I cried to you for help and you restored my health. Sometimes God will do those kind of things for you. I truly believe I'm alive today because I prayed and others prayed that I would live and survive a motorcycle wreck and open heart surgery. But what if they hadn't been praying? Wouldn't God still do what he'd do? Yeah, if God wanted to, he'd be out there. But God wants to work with people. God wants to do for you what you want to do for your grandkids and for your nieces and for your nephews and for your kids. And so there's times that he's got treats in his pocket that he's just waiting for you to climb up on his lap and say, is that for me? Can I have that? Ecclesiastes 11.10, refuse to worry and keep your body healthy. We talked about that some in Bible class this morning from James. James says that if somebody's sick, they should call the elders of the church. They should pray for them and they'll be healed. Did you know that at least, according to research I've read, at least half of physical ailments have a mental component to them? Ancient doctors all the way back into ancient Greece, there's writings that say belief in medicine is not needed, but belief in the doctor is. Sometimes you can give people a placebo and they'll get well. The power of the mind is incredible. It's, 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 it's incredible. And so God is saying, the one who made our minds and our body is saying, there are things you worry about that cause you to be physically ill. So what should you do about the things you worry about? You should do your best and take the rest to God. You should lay your head on the pillow at night and you should say, I have done my best. I trust that God will do what's right. If I die, I'm better off. If I live, I'll have another day. You can't lose. But you've got to be a Christian. You've got to be part of God's family for that to be true for you. Um, number two, you've got to get enough rest. There's a story about Elijah that had a, a long day with the prophets of Baal. He actually called down fire from heaven. Can you imagine? Called down fire from heaven. What more of a of a uh, what more of a blessing? What more of a uh, positive backing do you need from God to call down fire from heaven? 
And this fire wasn't just fire that burned dry wood. It, it burned wood that had been soaked with bucket after bucket after bucket of water. Impressive. But it was a long, hard day. And by the time he was done, he was tired. And at the end of that day, the queen said, Elijah, I'm so mad at you, I'm not going to eat until you die. And he was tired, and he was worn out, and he was hungry. And so what did God say? Man up, Elijah, didn't you see that fire from heaven? Why don't you trust me more? No. No. God sent him on a little trip, provided a cave for him to sleep, provided a raven to feed him, sent him on another trip, gave him more things to do and sent him back to work. He, put it, he, he sent him on a sabbatical. You think, well, why do you need a sabbatical? You just saw fire come from heaven. Well, how about your life? What do you, what do you need blessings from God today for? You, you've had bills that he helped you pay. You've been sick before that you got over. You've had problems in your family that you survived. You've been in car wrecks that you lived through. Isn't that enough for you? Well, it was enough then, but what about now? And one of the things that makes a huge difference is whether you get enough rest. And so uh, Isaiah talking about the Sabbath day, talking about people who generally work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, week after week after week. God says, I want you to have a Sabbath. I want you to have a day off once a week. And the idea behind the Sabbath was God created the world in six days. He rested on the Sabbath. We're made in his image. So God says we should uh, have one, at least one day out of seven to have rest. We shouldn't just work, 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 work. Why? Because we're not machines. There's more to you than just what you do. Your value is not just in what you accomplish. And so he says, if you watch your step on the Sabbath and don't use my holy day for personal advantage, if you treat the Sabbath as a day of joy, God's holy day is a celebration. If you honor it by refusing business as usual, making money, running here and there, then you'll be free to enjoy God. Oh, I'll make you ride high and soar above it all. I love the way the message says that. Uh, what's the point? The point is sometimes you need a rest. Um, in his book on the strong-willed child, Dr. John, James Dobson talks about parenting children that are strong-willed, and we needed that for our kids. All my kids are very, very stubborn. I think they take after their mom. I'm not sure, but um, very stubborn. And one of the things he talks about in there is, is what do you do? Uh, do, do, do you ever spank a child? And his, his saying, his, 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 his standard is, he says that parents should do like God does that we should pattern our parenting after the way God parents us. And he applies it in this way. He says, if you've got a child that's had a long day and they're sick or they're tired and they cry and they whine and they knock over the milk at supper, you just clean up the milk, you feed them and you put them down for a nap. Why? Because that's what they need. Now, on the other hand, if that child looks you in the eye, takes their cup and goes, eh, that's different. And his philosophy in that book was that just like God deals with rebellion hard, God comes down on rebellion hard. We too should come down on rebellion hard, but we shouldn't come down hard on mistakes and sadness and sickness and tiredness because God doesn't do us that way. Listen, there's times that you just need a rest just times you need a rest. I've gone to churches before where there's been somebody that said, you know, I've taught, I've taught the nursery class for 15 years and I'm just tired of babies. Am I a bad person? How do you answer that? Well, Jesus said, let the little children come to me, so you better straighten up, sister. No, no. You find somebody else to teach the nursery for a while and you give them a rest. You give them a rest. Um, church I was at in Pennsylvania gave, uh, sent me on two different sabbaticals. And a sabbatical can be the difference between your preacher doing a good job and lasting a long time and him going out in a flame of not so much glory. Because you just get tired. You just get tired. If you find yourself in an argument with your mate, you don't need a new mate. Maybe you just need to take a drive <laughs> and listen to the radio instead of them. You know, you just, sometimes you just need a rest. And how about pursuing physical health? Listen, there's more to pursuing physical health than just going to the gym. 
physical health includes how you eat, what you drink, how much you drink, how much you eat, what you do with your body, uh, the amount of sleep that you get. Um, there's more to just physical fitness than just uh, losing weight. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, some of you say, we can do anything we want to. And there's a point at which if you define all the words correctly, yeah, Christians can do just about anything they want to. Why? Well, first, because they're going to they should want to do what's right. Anything they do that's not right, God will forgive them of. And so I can do anything I want. Well, yeah. If, yeah. If you define all the words right, you can. You can. Paul says, but I tell you that not everything is good for us. So I refuse to let anything have power over me. Is uh, let's pick on Daniel. He's back there with a smile on his face. Daniel's a big fan, as everybody knows, of what college team? Well, see, everybody knows you, Daniel. Anything wrong with being a Bama fan? Yeah, if you're if you're a Huskers fan, like oh, this is not good. This is not good. If you're a if you're an Auburn fan, no, this is not good. If you're a University of Tennessee or University uh, any, any of these other any other any other university, no, it's, uh, you, you, you're part you're, you're you're pulling for the wrong team. So, is there a way in which being an Alabama fan could be a bad thing? And if you're a Husker fan, you say, well, yeah, just being one makes you bad. Now, we're talking about ethical morally now. Suppose <clears throat> Daniel's a married man with a new baby. Suppose they've got a playoff game. And he's offered a ticket for a 50-yard line seat. But his baby gets sick and gets put in the hospital. And his wife needs him to be there with her. What should he do? See, it's obvious, right? And if he picks wrong, there'll be about 15 of us that say, Dan, you messed up, man. Give me that ticket. I'll suffer through watching the game for you. I'll text you and tell you what's going on. But you go... You, you, your wife and your baby are more important than this team. Everybody agree with that? Suppose you're a Husker fan. Would that still be true for you? Uh, see, that gets a little close to the bone there, doesn't it? 50-yard line tickets. I could go to the game and then go to the hospital, right? <laughs> see, we can do anything. Could you go to the game and still be saved? Yeah. Can you make a mistake and not support your wife like you should and be, still be saved? Yeah. But not everything's good for us. And while he could be forgiven by God, I bet Key would take longer to forgive him. And rightly so. Right? Right? So the same thing is true with physical kinds of fitness. Is it okay for you to eat pecan pie? Can you go to heaven and have a piece of pecan pie? Can you eat the whole pie and still go to heaven? Yeah. Is it good for you, though? No. Should you take a little better care of the temple of God? Yes. If you don't take care of it properly, will God forgive you? Of course. But maybe you ought to have one thin piece instead of the whole pie. Can you eat cookies? Yeah. Can you go to heaven and eat cookies? I hope so. I love chocolate chip cookies. But there was a time in my life where I wouldn't eat one or two. I'd eat 10 or 12. And you give me a cup of coffee and a glass of milk, and I might double that. You say, that's how you got this way. Exactly. Exactly. Can I be forgiven for misusing God's temple in that way? Yes. But it wasn't good for me. And it made it hard for me today to eat just one because kind of like the, the Lay's potato chip commercial, you can't just eat one. I met somebody not too long ago that actually had a necklace. Did you know back when they did the, uh, the ad campaign, you can't eat just one? They actually had a campaign for people who wrote in and said, I ate just one. And they would send you a necklace with a, potato, a little small kind of gold colored potato chip so that you could wear. It. They, would, they got some advertising about you eating just one. Um, I don't know what that had to do with this. <laughs> but the point is, we should seriously pursue physical health. We should 
have a goal that we should be fit. We should have a fitness about us in all kinds of ways. And so he told the Thessalonians, he says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. The word holy just means set aside, special, select, chosen. May the God of peace make you special in every way. Make your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. That's my goal for you too. And if your New Year's resolution includes losing some weight or eating better, uh, eating more healthy foods, cutting back on some things, maybe your New Year's resolution includes going to the gym. You know, whatever your New Year's, whatever your resolution is, remember that the goal for the Christian is to be fit completely. It's not enough to just be a gym rat. It's not enough to just be a scholar. It's not enough to just be uh, whatever. There's a whole totality of humanity. And what God wants for us is he wants us to be good people. He wants for us, his kids, what we want for our kids. We want to be educated. We want them to have a good job. We want to pay their taxes. We want to pay, we want to be, uh, be, uh, be, be, be productive citizens. We want them to have a well-rounded life. That's what God wants for you too. But it does include physical fitness. And if you need to change what you eat, change what you eat. If you need to lose some weight, lose some weight. Say, well, I've tried, but I failed. I tried, but okay. So? <laughs> so is everybody else you know. If I was to add up all the times I've lost weight and gained weight, I probably lost over a 1,000 pounds in my life. Somebody says, wow, you were really heavy. No, I just gained it back. I had to lose it again. It's Okay. God loves me. Most of you guys love me. My wife and kids love me. But my wife prefers, prefers me smaller. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Is she going to leave me if I don't? No. But it is a worthwhile goal. Let's pray about this. Father, we thank you for the bodies that you gave us. Thank you for doctors and for nurses and for technology that... Uh, makes it possible for us to live more healthy lives, to have longer lifespans. And Father, we ask that you would help us to be people that truly appreciate the lives that you've given us. May we appreciate our families. May we appreciate our country. May we appreciate all the ways you've blessed us so that we can live balanced lives. When people deal with us, Father, may they, may they feel a, 